Doing all right? All right, now we're live. Okay, so thank you. Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. My name is Antonio Diaz, the founder of Life in Time. Um, and this is our first webinar. And we have so many more coming this week. Um, but I'm going to hand it off to my colleague and, and senior editor, Steph Ferrari, in a second. Um, but I do want to take a, I want to take a second and talk a little bit about our membership program because without it, we wouldn't be able to uh, make contents like this. Um, you know, our content is completely ad-free, and we rely entirely on on our paid members. Um, it allows us to create webinars like this, our printed newspaper and so many more stories online. Um, we also provide free access to people in the food industry that can't afford it because of our paid members. Um, so for more information, just head over to lifeintime.com after, after this webinar. Um, all right, Steph, do you wanna take it from here? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning into this. I'm pretty excited about this uh, this conversation that we're about to have. We have some really distinguished company here, um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But the um, the conversation is one that's pretty close to my heart as a, a former beverage uh, professional. Um, I have worked in the beer industry over the years. I'm a certified cicerone, and um, I have long felt very connected to the beverage industry. And when the pandemic started, um, obviously we've had a lot of conversations, since the pandemic started, we've had a lot of conversations about the restaurant business um, and the related industries, how this is affecting uh, those industries and more importantly, those people. Um, and I wanted to also kind of talk a little bit with some some experienced folks to see what they're, uh, what they're living through on the beverage side as well. So we reached out to some close friends here and uh, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves quick and then we will uh, we'll jump into a conversation that hopefully gives some insight into each one of their respective parts of the industry. And in the tradition of over coffee, uh, which is typically, it has historically been Life and Times in-person uh, panel series where we would gather and drink coffee in a coffee shop, uh, we, invited all of our guests to grab a beverage. Of course, time meaning absolutely nothing anymore. It doesn't really matter if it's coffee or maybe booze, which is maybe even more appropriate for this panel. Um, I'm actually drinking a coffee still, even though on the East Coast it's one o'clock um, from East One in Brooklyn. So if Selena's out there, thank you. Um, and I will just pass this off. So if we could maybe just go around, uh, maybe, uh, Aaron, maybe you could get us started and just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're up to. Sure. Um, I'm Aaron Sylvester and I own a natural wine wholesale company called Sylvester Rovine Selections, uh, with my business partners of Rovine, uh, who's based in New York. He's an importer. And uh, I'm based in Los Angeles, and yeah, we've been open for four years or so. I'm drinking all of the beverages, uh, although I'm also drinking Poxy Spritzer by my dear friend Josh. Um, why not? It's 10 a.m. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, Andy, do you want to? Hey, sure thing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Lardy. And I'm the winemaker and partner at Wonderwork. We're a natural wine company based in Echo Park. I'm also the head distiller at the Spirit Guild, the distillery in downtown Arts District, Los Angeles. And this morning I'm drinking a Yerga Chefe Conga, roasted by my mother in Maryland. Hi, Mom. And then looking at the roasting notes here, it looks like she roasted this at 1 a.m. So it's a special energy-driven version of the regular Yerga Chefe Conga we know and enjoy. Cheers. Sounds good. Um, Shannon, where are you calling from? Hi there. So I'm in a remote location in Hudson, New York. I'm based in Brooklyn. I'm the beverage director, aka spiritual advisor for Gladys Caribbean in Crown Heights. I'm also a spirits educator and consultant. And um, today I am sipping on a Marie Gallant Agricole that a friend was kind enough to bring back from a recent trip right before that opportunity uh, slipped through the cracks. Um, 
I'm also the author of Tiki Modern Tropical Cocktails, which was announced as a top 10 nominee for Best New Cocktail Book at Tales. Yes, you Massive congratulations on that. It feels great. I'm, I'm very happy. Well deserved. And Pat, how about you? Yeah, hey, um, so I'm Patrick Rue. I started the uh, the brewery in Orange County, California, uh, in uh, 2008, and got to work with Steph as one of uh, she was one of our first employees. So stoked to be on this with with Steph. And it's a very California word, stoked. So I grew up in Orange County, even though I'm very very pale. Um, see, now I am. I started up a new uh, winery. I, I live up in St. Helena, California, which is in the Napa Valley, kind of the middle middle of the valley, and. Um, uh, kind of focusing on uh, taking a, you know, if uh, if if wine could be craft beer, what would it be like? So trying to have a craft beer mentality when it comes to comes to wine and one of the most traditional wine producing areas in the, in the U.S. And uh, I I am drinking water out of a coffee cup. Uh, if I have more than one cup of coffee, I get kind of weird. So I thought I would spare you all of that. Uh, this is a delicious reverse osmosis um, water. It's yeah, it's, it's the best. Beautiful. That sounds really good. Um, well, thank you all again. And uh, I'm just going to jump right in because we have lots to talk about. And uh, I'm sure you all have many things to say and help us kind of help give us some perspective on this situation. Shannon, I'd like to start with you um, because I think across the board, there has been a major uh, impact to the alcohol business. Um, we're seeing, you know, from March of, of 2018 to March of, uh, I'm sorry, of 19 to March of 2020, we saw alcohol sales increase by 55% just in that month. Um, so we're seeing a lot of sort of explosive growth in the alcohol business, but one of the biggest changes I think that everyone's kind of seeing across the board is this idea of restaurants being able to do takeout cocktails. Um, that's something that I know many people are enjoying at home. Uh, picking up with their takeout. And I'm curious as a, as a cocktail consultant for restaurants that are, that are in, you know, participating in this, what, what, how has, how have you seen that being beneficial and also maybe challenging for restaurants that have never done this before? Yeah, sure. So what I saw in New York was bars jumping on it immediately. There was a, a segment of people that want to support their employees and make sure that there was some way to impart some income while they're waiting on PPE. But, you know, within three to four weeks, some of these establishments realized they didn't have the infrastructure or maybe the clientele to support that. Some closed for a week or two to make some adjustments. Some discontinued uh, altogether. And the establishments that were able to persevere already had some infrastructure in place and that maybe they were doing a lot of tap prior or they already had like batching things in place. So I'll cite, for instance, um, Dante. They have a very robust pre-bottled batch tap cocktail prior. So they were able to kind of keep it going. I've also seen some bars adopt it after four to six weeks. And again, I've not spoken to them directly, so I don't know the rationale, but I think some want to anticipate opening and test drive what they might anticipate as a new model for bars and restaurants operating at a lower capacity and needing to give some kind of service should our uh, municipalities allow bars and restaurants to do to go cocktails to support tax revenue and also compensate for you know, 25%, 50%, no restaurant can run in that margin. So, you know, some people have gone all out. I've seen some great packaging. I've seen some great social media. So I, I'm anticipating how this could be um, a new business model to make guests more comfortable as well as to make business in light of our new environment more viable. Yeah, definitely. Um, it seems like that's uh, that's something that could potentially make a big difference going forward, even for uh, bars and restaurants. 
Patrick, your your winery right now is uh, is direct to consumer. I know you're you're new, so you're sort of bypassing the restaurants altogether, at least for the moment. Um, and I'm curious, you know, that means you're reliant very heavily on tap room and shipping for sales. Given that the tap room is closed, what rules and regulations when it comes to shipping wine are uh, are helpful? Or you know, what are what what do those rules and regulations look like? And what do you maybe hope that might be expanded to sort of help support you uh, in terms of reaching more people during this time? Yeah, um, I guess thankfully there's already been a good infrastructure in place on uh, out of state shipping for wineries. It's been a probably 30, 40 year uh, project of the, the Wine Institute and family winemakers. Um, so right now we can ship, I think, to 41 different states. There's all kinds of different uh, regulations involved per, you know, with each state, but wine's in a pretty good position to kind of ship wherever you, almost wherever you want. Uh, West Virginia is a tough place to ship to, but, you know, probably don't have a ton of customers there. Um, and uh, they, locally, the ABC or California has allowed um, uh, delivery models that are free. You know, previously, you couldn't provide anything of value to a consumer or an alcohol producer can't provide anything of value to a consumer. That's loosening up a little bit with free delivery. Uh, so that's been helpful. Um, uh, just compared to the beer industry, um, that's much more uh, much more tightly regulated as far as shipping across state lines. Um, so I'd be really interested to see if um, if that'll loosen up at some point here. Um, just to support the small small producers, there's a lot of really sought after sought after beer that just can't travel across state lines uh, like we can do with wine. Yeah, that's a question, you know, that has been on my mind, especially given just what I know of shipping beer. Um, obviously, that represents a massive opportunity for revenue. Do you have any insight into why the beer versus wine regulations are so different and what the, those differences look like? Yeah, I think the wine industry has been uh, in the U.S. has been built by pretty small producers and they uh, have a lot of the power. Um, uh, I, well, I think traditionally they've had a lot of uh, a lot more power than the breweries, which um, and then small breweries. Um, so the U.S. has been dominated by really, really large breweries who really couldn't care about shipping directly to a consumer because the, the beer weighs too much to get it to a consumer in a uh, um, efficient and cost-effective way. Um, so you know, it's the wholesalers that have no interest in us direct directly, you know, cutting them out of uh, uh, out of the equation. Uh, the large breweries are not behind it, um, so just there's no political power behind uh, small breweries as there are with small winemakers. That makes sense. Yeah, and and on the subject of wine, um, Aaron, your business is um, largely with restaurants. Is that correct? Um, the majority of your we have a balance of restaurants and retail shops. Um, which we're very fortunate to have that. Some, some distributors really have focused more on restaurants or they're in a much more you know, dangerous place right now because of that. Yeah, and, and now those restaurants are also acting as retailers in a way. Um, many, yeah, many of them are. How do you see that impacting your business um, from retail to restaurant? And, and is there, are, are there any concerns with the idea of restaurants um, selling direct to consumer, uh, I'm sorry, s selling wine to consumer in, in the form of retail rather than sort of traditionally by the glass situation. Mm -hmm. um, from our perspective, it it is great. You know, we just want to be able to help buy people and, and get the wine into people's hands. Um, in California, there's you need a separate license to do on-premise versus off-premise sales. Um, and so most restaurants only have an on-premise license, meaning that the alcohol needs to be consumed on the location. Uh, some restaurants in California do already have an off-premise license. You can actually have both in California, which is different from many states, such as New York, where you can't have both licenses. That being said, um, there's the rules have been a little more lax right now. And yeah, restaurants that don't have off-premise licenses are acting as temporary retail shops. And I 
you know, really hope that the state of California can expedite those licenses to the uh, restaurants because they're going to need another stream of revenue. And having a, you know, small or some type of portion of, of wine to go, I think is a really great way to still operate uh, during, you know, during this time and obviously in the year, in the time to come, if they have reduced capacity and reduced seating, this would give them an opportunity um, itself to make it possibly make it through. Definitely. And are you seeing with your retail accounts any sort of anxiety about that idea of competition from restaurant selling as a retail? I haven't, in a retail yeah, I haven't heard that at all. Um, you know, retail sales right now, it's kind of, it's so strange. Retail sales are soaring. It's wild. People are drinking. It is like super crazy. Um, it does mean like for someone like me and for the retail shops, our sales are really high, which is uh, strange to experience during this time when, you know, we have friends and other people who are totally out of business. Um, but there's some risk to that also with uh, receivables and we're not getting paid for many things and uh, past dues have more than doubled since December. Um, and they doubled in the month of March. And, you know, so we're in a very vulnerable position. But I don't think there's an issue with competition. I, but I haven't, I haven't asked the retailers. But usually, I, I, you know, I think a rising tide should, you know, right, it should raise all ships. So it's um, hopefully everyone can play nicely together. Definitely. Oh, to your point, Erin, I think that the bottle sales that are coming out of the restaurants would be the bottle sales that they would do in their ordinary, you know, state of affairs, selling bottles during service. Well, it's possible that, you know, suddenly these retail shops that have had kind of a neighborhood, uh, you know, they've been the place in the neighborhood to buy wine to go. Suddenly there's five new restaurants that are also acting as retailers. It could, it could set up some competition in a different way, you know, but I still think there's enough to go around, you know, personally, that's always my attitude. I've seen that as, you know, so many distribution companies that are doing what I do that are natural wine distributors they've opened and, you know, honestly, I like their portfolios and I'm happy to have more in the market. And it's, so I hope that the same follows for that relationship, but I think we have yet to see how that really looks and feels. And Andy, you know, I'm curious in the, in the spirits world, um, historically speaking, when there have been times of economic downturn, beer and wine sales spike, spirit sales, decline, especially high-end and sort of boutique spirits. Has that been your experience with the Spirit Guild? And if if not, why do you think that might be? Or or if so, why do you think that's that's kind of happening now? That hasn't been our experience so far. We're seeing retail sales go up, actually, as we're available for curbside pickup, and we're now shipping within the state of California. Um, we're actually seeing orders coming in from our distributor. It's a murky... Uh, it's a murky thing to predict, you know, how it's being sold. Um, but seeing orders coming in from the distributor are indicating that our sales are remaining constant and certainly picking up uh, retail out of the tasting room. And you said you're now shipping. Is that as of the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, we're actually able to ship uh, within the state of California under a brandy producer's permit. Um, but we are seeing our our other distilleries in Southern California shipping direct as well. So we're happy that those easements are in place. You know, we're hoping for a rising tide here and we want everybody to be able to ship direct. It's something that we had a technical permit to do all the while. Mm, okay. And, you know, in the, in the world of spirits, Shannon, I think one thing that uh, we kind of saw as a trend prior to the, the start of this was the idea of RTD cocktails or ready to drink, um, which is a really convenient, you know, sort of packaged Negroni or a packaged old fashioned um, that were available at retail. And I've, I'm curious if you think that that idea and that, that trend, that popularity of those RTD cocktails has sort of um, given the industry a head start in being able to 
formulate these 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 drinks that are best in or that that work best in batched versions like the like a Negroni or an old fashioned. Um, did that sort of prepare the market? Do you think? It was absolutely a primer. Meanwhile, from my point of view, take it with a grain of salt. As a bartender, I I had an objection to the price points that were there. Um, so it was a good kind of baby step, so to speak. But now I think people would rather patronize their local who's doing something like that or look online and figure out how to do it at home in the lower cost. But that concept definitely um, got some traction from you know, those packages for sure. And what kinds of things do you keep in mind when you're creating cocktails that are going to be, uh, you know, meant to be consumed at home or that are not made on the spot to be to be consumed right then and there? Three steps at the most, maybe four, um, ingredients that are easy to get no matter what market you're in or, you know, things you probably have at home already, right? So ubiquitous spirits like gin, whiskey, most people have that at home. Rum is, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a niche around it. Um, but I know that, you know, let's take the Negroni forever. Yeah, that's a very iconic thing. Like most people might need to go out and get removed or Campari. The old fashioned is the easiest thing for just about anyone to pre-bottle at home. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I've had quite a few of those since, since this has started too myself. But uh, um, I want to go back to the the idea of shipping uh, quickly. You know, Patrick, you you talked a little bit about that. Um, when it comes to shipping, you mentioned the idea of free shipping and being able to offer free shipping. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that also, you know, it's obviously attractive to the consumer, but how does that impact your bottom line and your margins? Yeah, I think, well, wine is uh, traditionally not been, you know, free shipping has not been a, a thing there, or if it has been, it's been, you know, spend, buy six bottles at you know, $120 a bottle and you'll get free shipping, which, you know, doesn't represent that great of a value, but uh, feels better than paying 30 bucks for shipping on top of that. Um, so uh, I think much, many more uh, producers or wine producers are having to uh, offer the free shipping and discount their um, the pricing on top of that, um, you know, for us, we ship, uh, for $1, we just, we want to make sure we're not providing anything totally free of value when, when the, the law does shift back. Uh, so if you spend 99 bucks, you get $1 shipping and shipping, uh, right now that's just within California shipping generally costs us about $16, um, for, um, you know, anywhere from equivalent of four bottles up to eight bottles, um, so it represents, you know, roughly a 15 to 20% discount um, on our end to do it. Um, but we want to be seen as a, um, you know, a convenient, uh, you know, convenient minded um, sort of brand. We don't want to, uh, you know, we, we want to make it easy for people to buy our product, buy our wines and uh, be repeat purchasers. So we don't mind giving up some margin to do that. Yeah, and Aaron, on the, on the flip side of that, do you see any issues with importing? Are you having any trouble based on sort of um, what's going on in the world right now? Do you, are you experiencing any issues with that? No, I think <clears throat> not in terms of shipping, like the, the distribution lines have really remained open. And that was something that we didn't know, you know, initially if that would be considered essential or not, um, but transport has been operating, maybe a little delayed, but, um, I think so much of the stress right now is just, you know, we're having to make decisions in a very uncertain future and purchasing decisions are, you know, it's scary. Like we're not, you know, wholesale operates on razor thin margins. And so it's just, it's, it's been a lot to think about. Um, Zev made a decision to kind of put all the chips in the pile and just keep wine coming in from Europe. And I actually concurrently made a decision in California to just put all the chips in the pile. And I ordered so much wine uh, to California at a time when almost every other out-of-state distributor for Zev was stopping. And 
you know, fortunately, we've been able to continue because of those decisions, but those are the same ones that can ruin us. So, but there's not been any stopping um, from the wineries for anything. Yeah, and that idea of planning for the future, you know, Patrick or Aaron can maybe speak to this, but in terms of how far out growing and, you know, sort of the planting, how do you see this affecting wine maybe a year from now or five years from now, or what does that look like? Um, and have people sort of ceased their operations because of lack of labor or issues with um, with COVID uh, right that in the production that's happening? that would be happening right now. Yeah, uh, I'd say wine production here in Napa is kind of uh, business as usual with social distancing and uh, anybody who doesn't need to be there isn't there. Um, but uh, I think it ultimately is gonna, uh, there's already a glot of wine in California, um, uh, particularly Napa is definitely part of that as well. I uh, had a you know huge harvest in 2018, 2019 was pretty good too and um, so, when there's you know when the, there's a growth rate of three uh, percent per year and uh, all of a sudden you have 15 to 20 percent more wine than you did previously uh, you got to do something with that wine um so uh i see a lot of people uh, probably not uh, uh you know if they're contracted for grapes they're gonna have to take them but uh, if you're buying on the spot market you might not uh, be producing as much wine this year uh, you might be buying more bulk wine from other other wineries that are trying to get rid of wine um, so I see it ultimately affecting some of the growers, especially the growers that don't have the huge prestige, you know, vineyards, um, could have some grapes sitting and rotting on the vineyards. Um, I, I think, um, <clears throat> it's important to remember, you know, in terms of production, wine, especially organically farmed wine is, uh, unpredictable every single year, you know, and for everyone, not just organic, but organic farming is particularly uh, vulnerable and susceptible to uh, environmental problems and, and disease threats. Um, so our farmers are very used to that, but the main thing I keep worrying about is getting paid, you know? And, and, and that, you know, when if, if we as the distributor don't get paid, then we're gonna have a hard time paying our winemakers. And that's what I don't wanna see happen um you know so far where everything's okay but that's like to me the one thing that could hurt us all more than anything um but yeah production seems to be okay so far and the 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 issue with your accounts receivable right, right now is largely based on restaurants which are not operating which are not getting the relief that they need it's that trickle down effect right. yeah it's just that they were, you know, so many of them were restaurants who were ordering weekly drops from us. And so they have, you know, four or five open invoices that are each totaling, like each account is totaling, you know, five to 10,000 that they owe us. And, and it's, it's shocking. I can't even like say the numbers, like not. <laughs> and in terms of the, the, the wine that you're selling now, are you seeing a difference in what people are spending on a bottle per se yeah much less i imagine yeah oh yeah affordable wine is definitely what's flying off the shelves um you know we yeah large format is not moving nobody wants to buy magnums or jeroboms and we've got a ton in stock people are not buying you know high-end chablis so much it's it's like yeah, it's definitely more value. And also, again, like the known producers are the ones. We're lucky Zev has been importing wine for over 10 years now, and, and we actually have a pretty known portfolio, but that's not the case for everyone. And so I think that's part of um, what's moving and not moving. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, speaking on the producer side and making sure people are sort of paid and protected, um, Andy, how does production look for you all right now? Um, I know you are in the distillery as we speak. How are you taking precautions when it comes to getting labor in and how has that affected your ability to produce in volume and, and, and keep, keep in accordance with social distancing guide, guidelines and, and that sort of thing? 
Sure. We've minimized uh, the number of people in our distillery. We're very, very strict about that. Um, it's down to just bare bones, essential crew. It's me and my coworker, Tiana. Um, we've had difficulty sourcing personal protective equipment. And it's a, a daily struggle going through inventories, calling up suppliers saying, hey, are these really in stock? You know, we're forecasting a month in advance. We're entering uh, our bottling schedule and we're going to have to bring more labor in in order to accomplish that. And that's requiring a tremendous amount of planning with regard to our protocols, making sure that we have enough personal protective equipment. in. a lot of this stuff is coming in from China and, you know, it's opened up a whole new part of my life dealing with Alibaba orders. And that is a whole can of worms, sometimes quite successful, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, but we are producing around the clock, uh, extended hours with the minimal staff necessary. And we're lucky in that fashion that we're able to keep a pretty tight ship here with minimal exposure risk. And, you know, to the, one of the things that we keep hearing in this business is, um, is the word pivot uh, across the board, food and beverage. Um, Andy, I think your your industry specifically, distil distilling has demonstrated one of the most sort of unusual pivots that we've seen uh, you know, in many businesses where a, quite a number of distilleries and I think even some breweries now are also doing uh, hand sanitizer. How did that come about and what does that look like for you now? Indeed, I received, uh, you know, we were starting to formulate hand sanitizer uh, before the shutdown occurred, um, you know, just watching what was happening around the world. We started realizing, look, hand sanitizer is something that we need to have for ourselves, for our staffs, for our loved ones. So we started working on formulations and then we got a wonderful email from the TTB. I think that's the first time I've ever said this. Uh, directing us that, you know, you are now allowed to repurpose your ethanol, not initially tax-free, but later it came out as tax-free. You're allowed to repurpose your beverage ethanol for hand sanitizer production. And it was, I mean, an invigorating moment to, to be able to do something to help in this circumstance was just really, really energizing. So of course we pivoted on the fly. We were already sort of moving this direction. And since, I mean, it requires pivoting every couple hours, even within the vein of, you know, we've completely converted to hand sanitizer production, but even in hand sanitizer production, we're pivoting on the hour. This package is out of stock. We can't get caps for that bottle, but that bottle's available. So we're pivoting every hour. It's sort of an absurd dance that we're doing around here. Uh, and it's important to keep a good sense of humor because it requires completely recapitulating your plans on an hourly basis. And you're, and that's a product that you think you will continue to produce post COVID? Yeah, indeed. So uh, the TTB has outlined uh, an easement for us to produce this through December of this year. And we're hoping that that's extended. We see a lot of potential, especially in our tasting room for health and beauty products with uh, scents borrowed from our gin, borrowed from fermentation. A lot of post-fermentation products can be used in these as well. Hand sanitizer is something that we see even as the pandemic calms down eventually, we see hand sanitizer being a much more prominent uh, product in everybody's day-to-day -day shopping. It's gonna be a staple of the household. We wanna to continue to produce that. Hopefully we can start moving towards a more luxurious, enjoyable version. Uh, but at the moment we're producing the bare bones formula. We're just trying to clean as many hands as possible. Um, I'm gonna sort of switch to questions directed toward the group at this point. One of the things that we keep hearing throughout this conversation is regulations, you know, uh, laws in this state versus that state. It seems to me and has seemed to me for a long time that there is a really confusing patchwork uh, when it comes to alcohol laws, whether that's in restaurants with cocktails, distilleries, um, wine, beer. Can you speak a little bit to what, you know, what might come out of this in terms of more clear and consistent rules or what regulations might be helpful to each of your respective industries that would make this a little bit smoother um, and give small businesses more of a fighting chance. Um, Aaron, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think I pretty much said it before. I just think it's so important for restaurants to have the on the off-premise license expedited. It's hard to go the other way, like for an an off a retail shop to get an on-premise license because health codes and things like that 
But this way, it just seems so simple and easy. And I think that that would be the most important uh, licensing assistance that the state of California and hopefully the country can do. I think it's the, the most clear answer. Andy, what about you? Yeah, I, for us, we're, we're fortunate. We don't need a whole lot of change in the structure of how we're allowed to operate our businesses. Um, I do want to see these off-premise permits expedited. The conversion from an on-premise, off-premise bottle shop to bodega is something that's been really like the only beautiful thing that I've seen come out of this. And it's been a saving grace for my small wine company. You know, we don't currently have direct to consumer capability. We're actually lucky in that that's coming online quite soon, but we've been leaning entirely on our friends and partners in the Echo Park area in Los Angeles. The bodegas are really what's keeping us alive in terms of our sales. We want to see that continue. The way that I see it is as we start to open up, if you're going to a wine bar, perhaps there's not enough uh, room for you to join at a particular moment. We're going to have to be seating with more spacing and for all of those bars to be able to sell off premise in case you show up and there's not a seat available for you with proper distance, you need to be able to buy to go. And Shannon, what, what, would, what would you say on your end? Well, that reinforces the point I made earlier that I believe that to go is gonna be critical to the survival of restaurants. And again, you know, from the, the point of view of municipalities and the government, tax revenue, do you wanna forego that? I, I mean, again, in this time where, you know, it's kind of slim, I would hope that they'd be willing to work with us to make it work. And Patrick, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> I think some of the changes we've seen probably won't go away. Um, you know, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's hard to, it's hard to put it back, especially this is going to be a gradual process of, you know, right now it's, it's terrible. It's, uh, you know, a disaster for um, a lot of businesses. It's going to get a little bit easier, but it's still going to be hard and um, it's going to take years before things recover. And once things recover, we're going to get used to having our cocktails at home, and, uh, you know, having free delivery and um, being able to buy a, a growler at a, uh, you know, in California, we weren't able to buy growlers at uh, from a, a bar or a restaurant. And now you can. Um, it's going to be hard to, hard to take those things away. So I guess that's good. Definitely. And, um, you know, going back to that sort of initial statistic that we've had such an explosion of alcohol sales um, in the industry, I'm curious what you might hope the public understands about that, because I think there is this misconception that alcohol businesses are kind of killing it right now. Um, there's a ton of sales and the average person looks at that and says, oh, they're fine. Um, what, what do you hope the general public would know about what you're really going through. Yeah, I'd say if you uh, if you don't see um, our products on a grocery store shelf, we're probably not killing it. Um, I think there's some exceptions. Uh, Aaron, uh, you know, is, is doing uh, selling a lot of lot of wine, and um, that's that's uh, awesome. And, you know, there's always exceptions, but um, there's so many so many small producers that just you know have to if they're gonna they can only sell direct consumer at this point. And if their marketing uh, wasn't that good prior to, to COVID, it's probably not that, that great right now. So I'm, uh, I'm cherishing all of my 10 customers because we just started like selling stuff in essentially uh, late February. So uh, this is an interesting time, but those 10 people are, are gold. <laughs> Anybody else have any, any thoughts on, on what sort of maybe there might be misconceptions out there? Well, I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, we're selling wine. And, and as I mentioned, we're more vulnerable um, from a financial standpoint. But also, um, like my partner here at home, she's, she's a sommelier at a restaurant, she's totally laid off. And so even like within the family unit, you know, even some of us who are doing well in one respect are directly connected and linked with somebody who has lost everything temporarily. And she's facing, she and everyone I know are facing so much uncertainty because is that position going to exist again? What, you know, what does it look like? Um, will they be able to earn enough money to get by when the restaurants are seated at half capacity? So, so there's even connections 
um, amongst us and between us that I think are affecting all of us, you know? Yeah, and Shannon, you we we chatted a little bit briefly before before we got on the call today, and you had some some thoughts on that as well, and and sort of how we can support the personnel within the business. Yeah, sure. And speaking of support, this is my emotional support king of my jungle, Brutus. I, I think you guys have seen him in the shop before, but I thought he warranted an introduction. So, you know, one of the things that has been a topic in the industry. Where I would say like maybe three or four years is wellness, right? So I think that it has evolved from talking about physical wellness. Okay. And I'm talking from a bartender perspective, you know, how do we manage our diets? How do we manage our consumption of alcohol, our lifestyle overall, you know, there were, you know, and still are, you know, things that have taken place that have called attention to the need there. And so at this juncture, I think that while that is definitely something to focus on, now we have more time and also a greater necessity as an overall industry to go a little deeper into questions around mental health. Because if we're honest with each other, you know, this has been a, a very disruptive time, not only financially, but emotionally, mentally, as a lot of us experiencing losses that we've not and nor experienced. Yeah. So what does that look like? Yeah, I think that's a, you know, that's something that we're kind of trying to take this opportunity to evaluate what could be changed going forward for, for the businesses to make it more sustainable for, um, for the people within it as well. Um, so that we can all, you know, continue to provide the the much needed uh, drinks that that everybody's enjoying at home right now. Um, the in terms of getting alcohol at home, there is one question that has come up uh, a couple of times. How many of you maybe are working with third party apps and delivery apps like Drizzly and uh, there's a there's Saucy? I'm try, trying to think of the a, there are a couple of there. Um, I know obviously restaurants are doing a lot of takeout and working with, you know, the grub hubs and the, and the seamless and caviar. Have any of you been working with apps and how has that worked out? Nope. Nope. Nobody across the board. I'm sorry about that. Can we reach that a little bit? That was a yeah. loss of signal. Is, I'm sorry about that. Um, so the question is, while we're facing the um, challenges we yet to encounter as people in general and as industry, what kind of wellness can we contemplate individually as well as collectively? Like I've seen bartender yoga, I've seen bartender, you know, mindfulness, but I think everybody needs that. And so I'd love to see a conversation and ideas around how people are implementing that and how we can do it collectively. I mean, at the online world I has like, I'm, I'm just so used to being like productive, 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 but there's a lot of grief right now for various reasons. I think, how do we acknowledge that within ourselves? How do we create spaces for people to reckon with that? Because without readjusting mindset, all the work in the world isn't really going to amount to much. We need a foundation. So what does that foundation look like? Definitely. And it's a, it's a business built on connection, um, which I think, you know, we're all kind of feeling that isolation. Um, it's interesting because I think many, many folks have to use the term again, pivoted to try to find new ways to connect with their peers, their customers, um, and, and, you know, the people that they work with on a regular basis. There's been a lot of uh, virtual ways to reach out. Have, have you, any of you experiment, experience, experimented rather <laughs> um, with sort of doing online tastings or how, how have you found ways to connect with, uh, with other people during this time, whether it's coworkers or, or customers? Uh, we've conducted a few online tastings uh, through Zoom, and they've been really fun. Uh, we 
prepared heavily in advance for them and had a whole Rolodex of vineyard photos from our various sites. Uh, so as we're tasting the wines, we're able to take people through sort of a virtual tour of, you know, how we make this wine and educate a little bit on, you know, just spot viticultural teaching points. Um, and it, it's pretty fun. I don't know if anybody has played with the Zoom backgrounds. If you lean back, <laughs> sort of melt into the background. So I've been able to actually insert myself inside of a grape cluster and sort of talk about cluster morphology and whatnot. And it's been really enjoyable. I think it's, uh, you know, one of the fun things that sort of helped everybody have have a fun time rather than just burying your head in the corner and drinking that same bottle of wine at home alone. Yeah, the breweries had some pretty good ones. Um, I feel like uh, that I've joined in on. Um, so it's every week. There's a different sort of theme. There's a lot of guests that come on. Um, so it's been fun, just kind of switching. Um, not always having to be about your product, but about you know some of the things that surround your product. Yeah is cool but at erosion we have not because uh we just don't have that much to sell currently but we'll be on it soon i just decided to put on the virtual background nice it's a fish sauce that. yeah have you started drinking fish sauce <laughs> <laughs> <We're awful laughs> now, <though. laughs> um, um andy you're at the distillery now wondering if you wouldn't mind even giving us just a little look around to yeah, of course what your situation looks like of course please excuse the mess in here we're really piled in we have uh over twenty five thousand plastic bottle units and all of the packaging materials for that so what's otherwise a really beautiful tasting room is now basically a storage facility um so i'm in the tasting room right now i'm going to be walking out into our humble hand sanitizer bottling line uh, this is our beautiful Carl Still, which will be in operation soon. We're selling enough product that we do need to begin a new production cycle and procuring ingredients for that is going to be a whole nother can of worms that we're looking forward to. Here is Tiana, my coworker. There. And this is it. It's a simple gravity six bottle filler. We mix in these two tanks. And again, as you can see, we are just absolutely slammed with totes of high proof alcohol. There's hardly any room to move in here. And we often have to stage things outside, but then that's a security risk. And uh, we're inventing new ways to produce every minute of the day. Wow. Well, from our home to yours. Um, it sounds like uh, Antonio is telling me that we have some, um, some questions. We're getting some questions from the audience. So I think we have time for a couple. Yeah, um, so we got a few questions in here. And let's see, let's get started with, can I see, pin my, here we go. Okay, so we got a few questions here from the stream. Um, Elaine Leah, she asks, do you think this will help break down shipping restrictions, protectionist state laws in wine producing states back east? We certainly hope so. We're not seeing a whole lot of budging on interstate. By the way, hi, mom. This is my mother asking the question. Uh, we're not seeing a whole lot of easements that are allowing us to ship to other states. Uh, and again, this is respect to, uh, with respect to my wine business. Uh, we're currently relying on online partners who have much better shipping abilities than we do. Uh, in our case, primalwine.com is allowing us to reach other states. We're not seeing anything being juggled for us to enhance our abilities. We got a question here from uh, our boy Benjamin Weiss. He's our Life of Time contributor. Love that guy. Shout out to him. Uh, in store tastings have always been a big driver of alcohol sales. Doubtful that this model will return anytime soon. Any thoughts on how you'll engage new consumers without the ability to drive trial? Aaron, maybe you can jump on that since we kind of chatted about it. Well, <clears throat> um, in terms of for consumers, I do know like some retail shops like Domain LA, for example, they've been doing online tastings and um, and trying to you know provide some type of platform that connects the consumer and gives them enough information, um, you know, maybe not being able to actually taste or they can pick up the bottles in advance. So it's not quite the sampling situation. Um, but I will add another side to that, that for distribution, 
what I do, like, or what a sales rep does is we go to, we make appointments with our clients, with our retailers and our restaurant uh, sommeliers, and we set up tasting appointments and they, you know, they sample uh, and then select what they want. And that format's going to fully change. It has to, at least for the foreseeable future. So what we've done, uh, I just had yesterday delivered 240 two ounce jars, like little vials. And we're going to set up, uh, this was, this idea was given to me by my sales rep, Chris Scanlon, set it to him. Uh, but basically what he's locally called the natty caddy and like a deliverable wine tasting kit for our retailers and, and sommeliers so that they can still check out the wines and also will help us to not just sell the famous producers, but to expose them to some of the newer ones that have come in stock that aren't moving quite as fast. Um, so there's that, I, but I don't have an answer exactly for what could really qualitatively replace the experience of the in-store tasting. I, not sure. Yeah, I have something to add there. Um, so the TTB in California, uh, and several others, I think 10 other states have uh, allowed 500, or sorry, 50 and 100 milliliter uh, tasters to be sold directly to consumers um, with proper labeling and all that stuff. So um, we'll be doing a, you know, we're gonna have a set of five wines. You can uh, you know try alongside us and. Uh, perhaps make it, you know, if you buy a certain amount of product, we make it fairly inexpensive or similar to the price if, if you were in our tasting room. Uh, so I think there's opportunity there. It's kind of a pain to fill little tiny bottles, but you know, do what you do what you got to do. Because well, I just got to put out there in, in that realm of the the sampling bottles. I mean, for better or for worse, there's a captive audience, right? So. There's an opportunity to, to do education online, to do partnerships with retailers to provide them with more information that they might want to convey to their customers in various means. Um, but what I found, having worked in retail prior and having worked on premise in a bar that specialized in the category that hasn't got a lot of love, is that people don't know where to start often, depending on the category. I'm, I'm talking specifically about rum. So people having an opportunity to spend a little more time being adventurous, I think, is uh, an opportunity. How do we address that? Shannon, that, that leads into uh, a question here um, from the best seats. Uh, what has it been like seeing the influx of at-home cocktail education from various bartenders, beverage directors in the cocktail community? What else can bars and bartenders do in this time? Well, I mean, to be quite frank, I'm talking from a New York perspective with, you know, keeping a little bit of an eye on L.A. It, it, it seems like bars are really focused on maintaining a little stream of revenue. And so there's not a lot of bandwidth to convey that information at the moment. But I think it's going to be instrumental in keeping people engaged. I, it's... It might be a little far off because I think we're in survival mode right now. I think retailers will benefit the most in the interim from give, giving people that information. But again, it all depends on how much traffic are we gonna see on premise and how much are people gonna to prefer to remain at home? What is the demand going to look like? And that will drive what's going on in terms of information online and tutorials we don't know what the demand is going to be as of yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we got time for maybe one or two more questions here. So we've got one from uh, Habajap 2K. To the wine folks, how is Corona going to affect Harvest 2020, working in the cellar, etc.? cetera? Uh, it's going to make it uh, a little more difficult, some of these um, you know, if we're trying to maintain six feet of distance, uh, there's, you know, when you're putting in grapes into a hopper and you're, uh, you know, sorting in the stem and all that stuff that there's often, oftentimes where you need more than two sets of hands. So, um, I have no idea how it's going to go. It should be interesting. 
Yeah, I'm pretty lucky in that uh, my extra set of hands lives with me. He's a part of my pod, so we don't require quite as much distancing. And that's, you know, something that we've really focused on is who's in your pod and what are your skill sets. Um, hopefully we're going to be granted access to the winery. That's still, you know, sort of on the horizon. But yeah, maintaining more distance. And to be honest, like as much as I love the people working alongside me, sometimes six feet of distance is going to be an improvement over the normal state of affairs during harvest. <laughs> all right guys well it's uh it's just about 11 a.m here in in la um thank you everybody for for tuning in thank you for all our panelists and our colleague steph ferrari um how about everybody uh just say how we could find you right now like uh throw some instagram handles or links or or what, uh, what, how can we learn more about you? Um, give us like a final, a final send off on, on how we can learn more about you. Well, I, I stay away from handles. It's just my first and last name, Aunt Shannon Musfra on Instagram. You'll, you'll see what I'm up to. There are gonna be links to events, panels, XYZ. Look me up there. You can find Wonderwork, my wine company, on Instagram at wonderwork.la. You can find us at Tilda and Echo Park, also online at primalwine.com. And the Spirit Guild is our Instagram handle. You can find us at thespiritguild.com, order direct. We're able to ship spirits throughout California and hand sanitizer throughout the country. Uh, our, we have Instagram, sylvester.rovine is our Instagram. Um, and yeah, if you're in Los Angeles, you can, or you can go to our website, sylvesterrovine.com and you can shoot me an email and I'll personally respond and tell you some retail shops if you're in California uh, that are close to you where you can find our, our wines. You can find us at uh, our website, erosion.wine and on uh, social media channels at uh, whatever your social media preference of choice slash erosion wine. Also, the brewery is at uh, the brewery, B R U E R Y dot com. Amazing. Thank you all so much for your time and for your continued work. Um, I know I speak for a lot of enthusiastic drinkers uh, that we appreciate um, everything that you're doing. And, and hopefully, we can continue to have the conversation. And I hope everyone at home will continue to support their small businesses, their small bars, their small restaurants, their small brewers, distillers, wineries, distributors, um, seek those people out. And, uh, and these are, these are the people behind those businesses. So let's, let's continue to give them the support that they deserve. Thank you, everyone. And we have, uh, many more webinars coming up soon. So stay tuned. Um, and we'll be sending it out on our socials, on our newsletter and all that good stuff. Um, but, uh, everybody stay safe out there. Take care.